Now as we begin to get ready to read Hosea, as a writer, I often think, wow, I'd love to write something that would last, you know, that would be enduring. I mean, how great would it be? There are only 66 books in the Bible, so how great to have your name on one of them. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome to be Hosea? What did you do for the kingdom? Oh yeah, one of the 66 books, that's mine, Hosea. But the price he paid, the price he paid in what God asks his prophets to do, to have his writings be remembered, he had to do something literally that lasted his whole life to be a demonstration for his people. That's what we're going to be looking at in just a moment. But let's ask the Lord to guide us. We thank you, gracious Father, that you've called us here. We thank you that it is your desire to speak to us. We know it is the work of your Holy Spirit to open the word in our hearts and minds and to change us. Would you please do that now? In Jesus' name, amen. So from Hosea chapter 1, uh, verse 2, and then chapter 3, verse 1, and then some from chapter 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom. Have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Wow, did we get the point of that? Pretty strong. Chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love the cakes of raisins, those offerings that were made to foreign gods. And then this was the reason for that from chapter 2. And in that day, declares the Lord, I, you will call me husband. No longer will you call me Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from your midst, and they shall be remembered by name no more. I will make for them a covenant on that day, a covenant with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and then you shall know the Lord. That's good. There are lots of things that we live by. Lots of stories that tell us about our identity. Lots of things that we take in. All this bread, though, doesn't satisfy and man shall not live by bread alone. Whew, that was bad. <laughs> man shall not live by bread alone. There we go. Let's seek that word of God. Well, maybe you went to Dunham School this weekend to see the play Les Miserables, or maybe you're going this afternoon. Or maybe, like us, you were in the theater on Christmas Day when the movie version of Victor Hugo's novel uh, first came out. Les Miserables has been a worldwide sensation about Hugo's novel. And it is, at root, the story of two men and their response to grace. As you know, the protagonist, the hero of the story is Jean Valjean, and his nemesis is the police chief Javert, who chases him through the decades, trying to imprison him and put him away as a criminal. Well, both men experience mighty moments of grace in their lives. Jean Valjean's comes early. He'd been in prison for 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family. When he finally gets out, he has to wear the badge that shows he was a criminal, and everyone is shunning him and rejecting him. Only a poor priest takes him in. But that night, in his anger and bitterness, Jean Valjean steals the silver from the priest's cupboard and steals off into the night. Of course, he's caught, and the police ask him where he got the silver, and he makes up this lame excuse, the priest gave it to me, as if. So they haul Jean Valjean to the priest, and they say, this man says, you gave him the silver. And in a flash of inspiration, the priest goes to his cupboard, grabs the silver candlesticks, gives them to Jean Valjean, and says, indeed, I gave that to you, and sir, you forgot the best. Take these. Jean Valjean is set free, and this overwhelming grace comes over him, and he has to decide what to do with his life at that time. The priest has whispered to him, I have bought your soul for God. Jean Valjean accepts the claim of God on his life, and he is transformed, and he becomes, throughout the novel, a great force for goodness and truth and love. 
Police Chief Javert's moment of grace comes later in the story. After hunting Jean Valjean unsuccessfully for all those decades, Javert is caught as an infiltrator in the student rebellion. He's been sent to spy on them, but they find him out and determine that there's no good that could come to such a spy except to shoot him. Jean Valjean was also among them, and they give him the gun and let him go shoot this traitor. But Jean Valjean doesn't shoot police chief Javert. He fires his gun up in the air and says, now go, your life is your own. It's a moment of grace Javert does not deserve, but he can't take it. It rocks his world to think that the man he thought was a thief is actually a good guy, that the man he hunted is actually a worthy man, that everything he lived for was wrong. So overwhelming is the grace that Javert throws himself over the bridge into the Seine River. Grace, you see, is always powerful. It always transforms, sometimes unto everlasting life, sometimes to our ruin. Well, that takes us back to our story from last week, a story from the fourth century about a man named Eutropius. You remember Eutropius did not have a good beginning to his life. He'd been made a eunuch, yes, castrated, so that he could be given to be a safe servant of a royal daughter. Eutropius was handed to this royal daughter as a wedding present to be her servant. But his disfigurement and the puffiness in the face and the smoothness of skin that came from the castration made him creepy to her. She didn't even resell him. She just put him out on the street, a disfigured, impoverished slave. Well, as his life went on, Eutropius caught on in the imperial palace and through ruthlessness and venom and intrigue and manipulation and guile, he rose in the ranks until he became the second most powerful man in the Eastern Roman Empire. But along the way, we remember, Eutropius made no friends, only enemies. He was amoral, vile, poisonous man. So when the tables turned on him, and remember they always do, Eutropius always falls. He had to seek refuge in the place he hated the most. He ran to the cathedral of Constantinople and sought sanctuary in the church. That's where the archbishop named John found him, clinging to the columns of the altar, begging for mercy. Well, John received a second name, a nickname that has stuck with him through history, Chrysostom which means golden mouth. John the golden mouth, John Chrysostom, was so named because his sermons were so eloquent and powerful. And what a setup he had on Sunday. He had defended the enemy of the church against all the emperor's soldiers. He had gone at spear point to the emperor to plead mercy for this evil man. And on Sunday morning, when that evil man was still clinging to the altar, John Chrysostom had a packed house who wanted to hear the story of grace. So we heard last week that he told him. He named the sin of this man and then said, like unto the prostitute that came to our Lord who was received, forgiven, and cleansed, we the church will in the same way receive this enemy. We will forgive his sins in Christ's name. We will shelter him as long as he will stay with us. Eutropius was offered grace. That's where we left it. So what did he do? Was it Jean Valjean who received grace unto new life? Did he become a great leader in the church? Or was he Javert for whom grace wrecked him? Well, think about it. As long as we have breath, it's not too late for any of us. Technically speaking, nobody who lives is beyond the reach of God's saving grace. But statistically speaking, the longer we harden our hearts and run from that grace, the less likely it is that we will turn. There are a few more chilling passages than Romans 1, 28, where Paul says, when they did not acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what is unacceptable. God gave them up. You know how it is when you struggle with God you know what his will is, but you say, let me do my will. I always do that like a petulant child counting on God to keep saying, no, come back. No, here's my will. Here's another chance. But what if God were just to say, fine, do what you want. Have it your way. 
I'm done with you. Wouldn't that be like the definition of hell? So what was it for Eutropius? Think about the road he'd been down. He was like the prostitute in Jesus' story. As a young man, he had been taken over. His life was not his own. He was a slave. He'd been abused, literally disfigured in body. He had been out of control, dismissed at the whim of someone else. When he got a chance at control, he determined, like so many abused people, I will never be enthralled to anyone again. And his wounds had made him bitter, venomous. Could he trust the grace of people he had hunted as enemies? What happened? Three days later, he ran from the church. He fled the sanctuary. He couldn't believe the church would risk itself to protect him. He was immediately captured and soon after beheaded. Bummer. Didn't you want a better story? The ornament for the altar, a story of great grace? Something we could put in a book and say, look what God does to even the worst of the worst, the wounded of the wounded? I bet John Chrysostom thought that too. He was all set for Sunday. Look, I got this guy in front of me. This is a great story. The problem for the preacher is, though Eutropius ran, Sunday came anyway. What's he going to say? What do you say when the ornament of grace has fled the sanctuary and received a well-deserved violent end? Well, he wasn't called golden mouth for nothing. And he wasn't timid mouth either. Chrysostom decided when the church was packed with a well-educated, well-heeled, well-dressed, well-living people of Constantinople that he would first of all remind them of who Eutropius was. He was you and me. He wanted to remind them that Eutropius, the enemy of the church, is not some sinner out there. He is the wounded sinner right here. In fact, Chrysostom connected his parishioners to the prostitute in Jesus' parable. How's that for a while? I didn't come to church to be called a harlot. The archbishop had no fear. He didn't care what people thought about him. So he picks it up. He says, look, the harlot is human nature. He was, as we read, taking a page right out of Hosea, right? Hosea was told, you go marry a whore. Have children with her. Stay married to her as an example to my people who are spiritual prostitutes before their God. That's a price to pay to have in your name put in the Bible, isn't it? You go marry an unfaithful woman. Have kids with her. You be faithful to her so my people will see in you that I'm interested in people who commit adultery against me all the time. That's wild. It got wilder. It gets really wild. He goes, he says, God desired a harlot. And he says, think about it. When a man wants a prostitute, he wants to become a fornicator. God desired a harlot to be her husband. When a man takes a prostitute, he enacts destruction upon her. But when God betroths a harlot for himself, he makes her a virgin again. Does a man go to a prostitute looking for a wife? Of course not. He goes to enact his lust, maybe to get away from his wife. But God comes to the harlot, which is human nature, humankind, to marry her and be her husband. And then the golden mouth raises this question and lets it float in the air. Why would the almighty, all-holy, all-perfect God desire a prostitute for a wife? He answers it with mystery because he wants to be her husband. Why does he love you? Because he loves you. Because he wants to be in a relationship of provision and cleansing and life-giving everlasting covenant love with people whose hearts are no better than harlots. You don't hear that in church much, do you? That's crazy preaching. 
You could see, they were shifting around here. What do you mean, us? We are the respectable people of Constantinople. How dare you? He wasn't done. He said, so what does he do? What's his strategy? Do you come down to such a compromised, wounded person in all your glory? No. He decided to come to her gently, so he became what she is. He took up human nature, flesh and blood. He came as a man softly, gently to us. The golden mouth says, he came to her in her secret place, to her in her drunkenness, and he found the harlot brutalized, oppressed, full of sores, and he spoke gently to her. What a gospel. God says, I know your heart. You're not faithful to me. Oh, you come to the wedding feast, the preview, church, all dressed up, cleaned up, looking good. You go out and sell your hearts for nothing to lesser gods, to worry, to greed, to lust. I know who you are. I'm coming to you to marry you. Now, if a man is going to ask a woman to get married, what does he bring with him? Besides words, a ring. Chrysostom knows that. He says, look, he brings a ring, a signet ring, his own ring that is the sign of his identity and authority to give to the harlot to get engaged to her. And what is that ring? His blessed Holy Spirit, he says. He puts the blessed Holy Spirit in the heart of the prostitute as a pledge of his entire life to her. And then there's more. He says he comes with a dowry. He says, I come to give you my wealth. Have you lost paradise? Take it back. Have you lost your purity? Take mine. Have you lost your wealth? Have my house. You can have it all. I have come to give you everything that I am. But Mark, the dowry will come after the wedding. For now, you get the pledge, the ring, my Holy Spirit in your heart. For now, you get these wedding gifts the forgiveness of your sins, the peace that passes understanding, the comfort of my presence, the fellowship of my body. But remember, be of good hope. More is to come when the wedding happens. This is wild kind of preaching, isn't it? Here he is on the one hand comparing his wonderful, beautiful, kind audience to common harlots. And on the other saying, and God has come to marry you to betroth you to himself. He's come to give you a wedding gown, the shimmering garment of his own righteousness. He's come to give you wedding gifts, his Holy Spirit in your heart, and he's come to promise you a honeymoon. Oh boy, what a honeymoon. It makes Tahiti look like a dump. You're going to live with me in the palace I am preparing for you. I just want you to say yes. glorious story. Once we get the awful truth, I am Eutropius, the wounded one, the venomous one, the evil one. Then we can get the staggering reality that he loves me just because he loves me. Wow, he comes to her secret place where she has to stay drunk all the time so she doesn't face her life. He comes to that secret place in your heart where you've been so deeply wounded you can't let anyone see it and you do all manner of drugging to keep from having to face that wound. He comes and he touches it with love. He comes to that secret place of shame where we're so embarrassed and if I just gave you five minutes the memories would come flooding back to you that that time when you were most found out for who you are and all your neediness he comes right there and says gently I know you and I love you he comes and puts his finger on the yearning for life and love that was at the heart of every stupid sinful thing we ever did all we were really seeking he knows what that is he touches it, and he says, I want to set that free in you. He comes. As I meditated on this passage this week, I thought, I don't think very much about being the bride of Christ. I don't think enough about it. The Almighty God wants to be the bridegroom of me 
a cheap, wounded, common, brutalized, sore-filled, disgusting harlot. Not only that, but he promises a dowry. Think about that. The dowry was normally given by the bride's family. You know how that works. The father talking to the future son-in-law. Look, son, I know she's really dull, but if you go ahead and marry her, you get the house at the beach and 10,000 shares of Exxon. Really, it's okay. <laughs> it was an incentive. Just joking. No offense. It was an incentive for the man to take the bride because he had to provide and care for her. But it's all reversed here. The bridegroom, Jesus, is willing to pay the dowry on us. Do you get that? He comes to the harlot, that's us, and says, I will pay you to marry me. Who can believe such love? If I let go into that love, I'm out of control. <laughs> there is no more, I'm going to be in control of what I want to get what I... No, it's gone. That is crazy. It sets my heart dancing. It makes all the little gods I follow so puny. What am I worried about? What in the world will we be worried about if our God has pledged that dowry to us? That's how much I love you. Who are you worried about? I'm building a house for you in heaven. Right now, you can have me join to you forever. It means I have to let go of thinking I earn it or I can manipulate it or stake a claim against him. I have to be a kept woman. I bring nothing to the table. I don't even have virgin purity to offer him. He's got to supply it all. Righteousness, purity, the garment, the wedding, it's all his. Can I trust that? Can I fall back into the wonder of that grace? When you do, joy is released. What can this world do to me? My man is taking care of me. My bridegroom loves me. We are all the bride of Christ, no matter how manly we are. He is the groom with such gifts he offers. The wedding ring. Engaged women love to look at their wedding ring. I remember Rachel on her, the day she, Christmas Eve, she did not listen to my sermon. She sat in that pew looking at her ring. I forgave her. I understand. Well, how about us? Are we looking at our ring saying, "Woo"? Look at that shine. The Holy Spirit is pledged to me forever. And I am little more than a whore at the core. There it is. If we are willing to face the awful truth about ourselves, then we are released into this grace. The Lord God says, I chose you to be my wife, knowing full well who you are. I'll dress you. I'll provide for you. I'll cleanse you. Will you enter the marriage of the Lamb? Don't be Eutropius or Javert. Grace ruined them. They couldn't take it. They couldn't face the truth of themselves or the truth of the love of God through His church. No, let's be Jean Valjean. Let's let this overwhelming grace cause us to live wholly and totally for Him. Let's go out and talk good things about our husband. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the golden mouth who spoke so truly of the Scripture that you called your prophet to marry a harlot that we might see that you are marrying us. We thank you for the beauty of your love. Wash over us with that grace. Set our hearts dancing. Allow us to release and relax into the wonder of your love.